<laughs> Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the 959th monthly meeting of AppMob. Uh, tonight will be a member's talk, we'll have three talks, from one from Joseph Rothschild, one from Kai Kai, and then one from myself, Corey Mooney. And uh, in my president's message on the newsletter, I mentioned sort of the, the great year that we had in astronomy, all the professional astronomy going on, tons of excellent you know, science missions going up into space and ground-based discoveries going on. And also just as a club, we've had a pretty great year uh, returning to the CFA in person, the Middleman at Mob churning out great data, making tons of progress, brand new website next to Maria and the website committee. And uh, so I, I hope everyone uh, had a good new year, good holiday, got to spend time with family. If you got any new Astro toys, had a couple good days of weather to hopefully get some use into them. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the agenda. So next up, we have the observing team. <laughs> Come on, bud, it's our turn. I wish, I wish I didn't live in an apartment and I could do a little bit of that. I got about 45 degrees. Just get a wrecking ball. Yeah. <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was a very young yeah, and just starting out in astronomy. My, uh, my dad uh, built me an observatory in the garage roof, the pier for which is still sticking up through the roof, even to this day. But I, I said to him one afternoon that I wish the neighbor's tree in the next yard over wasn't as large. He had a big maple tree. So my dad um, went across the, uh, across the yard, talked to the gentleman, and asked if he could trim some of the branches off the tree. And it, it pretty much looked like this on the top of the tree when it was done. He literally planed the top of that tree right flat so I could have a pretty good view to the south. So that was kind of fun. Um, so th this, is, uh, this is ongoing. Mario just reported from Florida he had cleared some brush so he could better polar align and do whatever else he does with that monster telescope he's got down in Florida. But I thought this was a great, um, a great cartoon. Um, thanks for finding that, Glenn. Right. Yeah, that was a member of, actually, that was from a, an astronomy club in Texas, and I found a couple more, so you'll be seeing more of these in the future. All right, hit the button. What do I hit anyway? Oh, oh wait, this is a bad uh, idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a classic pig. With, that's like, like uh, American Gothic. Okay, yeah. Anyway, Sal came up with this. My New Year's resolution is 0 0.3 arc seconds. That's from Sal, an optimistic gap mob. I put this part in. <laughs> okay, and this now, guy's in New England. <coughs> All right, so onward to so the real stuff. There we go. I don't know how many folks have gotten up in the morning to see this comet. I have not yet. I'm not much of an early riser. So from what I understand, it's a, a fairly bright comet, and it continues to brighten. I'm just going to refer to it as ZTF. Um, Comet ZTF is currently in Boötis, and it's coming northward at, with each passing day. On the 18th of January, well, tomorrow, um, it reaches perihelion, 1.1 um, uh, astronomical units from the sun. Um, on the 18th of January, it becomes circumpolar for here in Frank, uh, from here in Boston. So you won't have to get up in the middle of the night to see it unless you want it nice and high in the sky. But as the days go by, it'll, it'll get higher and higher in the sky in the evening, and it'll be better placed until, well, on February 2nd, it'll be as close as approach. It's got a, it's a nice, got a nice green gas cloud to it. It's got a nice dusty nucleus to it. So I, I would wholeheartedly recommend getting out there and observing it. The next, the next slide is a finder chart um, from Sky and Telescope Magazine. Glenn, I didn't use yours. I, this one seemed to be better. But here it is. Here, here we are about right here right now so it's it's just at the corner of Boötis and Corona Borealis heading that way and as you can see it as the month rounds out to the end it passes by the little dipper um, in the sky so that it, it'll be really well placed for evening observing and I would encourage everybody with it, whether you try and spot it with your naked eye the estimates are pushing it up towards about magnitude 5.5 from around here that's tough to do naked eye but Give it a try with binoculars. Certainly check it out with your telescope. Images have a field day with this one um, because it's a really pretty comet and uh, it'll be with us for a little while. Um, apparently this one hasn't been in the inner solar system for 50,000 years. And so this is a, uh, a, a one-shot, well, a chance of a lifetime to see this comet. So, yeah, one thing, there will be a window. Your best opportunity is around the 22nd of uh, January this month. 
and it was screwed by the ball of the little dipper around, I think, the 25th through the 28th, somewhere in that area. And we'll get it its brightest on February 2nd, but you're dealing with a near full moon at that time. So again, start thinking about the 22nd. It'll be circumpolar, it'll be in the northern sky, so you don't have to get up at an ungodly hour to see this thing. And then it, right now it's about seventh magnitude. And I heard reports of like about a two degree tail. I know Joseph Rothschild, I think he said in a report that he'd seen it in the morning sky. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So here are the observing highlights for the month, and they're, they're few and far between, actually. Most of them are just conjunctions between uh, planets and the moon. Um, and there they are. Venus is a third degree south of Saturn on the 22nd. The 23rd, uh, the moon joins Venus on the 25th. Uh, at around sunset, Jupiter is four degrees north of the moon, um, approaches Uranus on the 28th, and on the 30th, it does its thing with Mars. Um, there are no convenient minima of algal to worry about, but I, I would remind folks that SS Cygni is still, it's getting low in the sky in the evening, but it's still within reach if you want to take a look at a cataclysmic variable star. That's a pretty fun one to look at. Um, but these planetary alignments are always fun, especially when you've got bright, bright planets like Jupiter or Mars uh, these days near the moon. People tend to pay attention and they may even ask if they know you are into astronomy, they may well ask you, what was that star I saw by the moon last night? You know, because just people just sit up and sort of take notice of these things. Um, so you'll be able to tell them. You'll be able to tell them. Perfect. All right, next slide. So these are the planet roundup for the month. Again, um, I always encourage Venus in the daytime. Look, it's 40 solar diameters away from the sun. It's, it's, it's like child's play to find Venus in the daytime now because you don't have to worry about blinding. My record is 1.69 degrees away from the limb of the sun. And I don't recommend that to anybody. Um, an unfiltered telescope playing less than two degrees away from the sun is, is um, that's, um, um, well, it's a, it's a good sport to get involved in, but it, you have to be super careful. But 20 degrees away from the sun, you can find that in the daylight sky, easy peasy. So I recommend everybody give that a shot. Um, Saturn is setting early. If you want to see Saturn, you've got to get out there now. Neptune, almost the same deal, 9.30 in the evening. Jupiter um, sets at about 10.30 in the west, and this is another one. Um, I just sent out an email the other day suggesting that it was possible to look at Jupiter during twilight because I was reminded with one observation I made of my days, even as a kid, at that observatory with the chopped off tree next door. I always noted that Jupiter seemed, the sky seemed to be the steadiest right at sunset, before sunset, maybe just a teeny bit after sunset. So if you want to look for detail on Jupiter, this is the time to do it. It's not, it's past quadrature, so it's, it's about 75 degrees away from the sun. But it's easy to find in a, in a daylight sky, especially when the sun is low in the sky. Um, I use, I, I think I mentioned it in the email, and I'll say it again just so you'll hear it. I look up the altitude and azimuth in my favorite app, Sky, sky Spark. I use my compass on my phone and my tilt meter to aim the Dobsonian telescope and I'm usually within a degree of the planet. I can see it in the finder scope. And once you have it in the finder scope, it's yours. Um, Pre-focus your telescope if possible, because if you, in the daylight, if the outer focus image of Jupiter will, will blend into the background. So try to get it as pre-focused as possible, and then go for it, give it a shot. You, the detail's pretty cool. I'll continue to send out my um, great spot transit times and the shadow events for another month or two before it gets a little too far to the west. So with all that information, you should be able to go out and look at, at, at that guy. Mars is getting smaller, 12.6 uh, arc seconds. But I saw some pretty good details. Um, and these days, um, Sirius Major is front and center in the, in the evening hours. It looks like a shark tooth in your telescope, in your inverted image. So that's, a, that's the darkest surface feature on Mars, right? And it, it makes it pretty easy to see. What was that distance for Jupiter or for Venus and the Sun? You said how close did you get them? One point, a little under. It was one point six nine degrees from the I, limb of the Sun. I got them in a half a degree. So there you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend that. That's <laughs> yeah, so okay. when, when you look at when you're looking at Venus at inferior conjunction or superior conjunction. It's close to the Sun like that. You have to be ultra careful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't make a mistake. So you have to really, really know what you're doing to to do that. And I don't really recommend it. Unless you practice, practice. So anyway, let's get on to the stuff. So go ahead and talk about this. Okay, uh, the one for this month is NGC 1245. It's a, a oh, open cluster. Uh, it's actually near Alpha Persei, and that's, there's a major cluster right there, a naked eye cluster. And it's a little bit of a star hop down. Uh, we have a closer, go ahead and hit the next button. I don't know if we have a closer one or not. 
<laughs> the arrow key? This one? Yeah, we got it. I went back up there and we'll do the images. I thought there was a closer map, but we, I guess not. Let's flip it back and let's see. I don't think we have the chat that I had sent originally. No. Uh, do you know whose image is this? That's Doug Paul's. Okay. And there were two stars, about eighth magnitude. The cluster is it's faint. I'm going to tell you, it was faint. It was a tough object, and I had a 10-inch reflecting telescope. And even with that, of course, I had about magnitude 5 skies. The scene wasn't, or the clarity wasn't all that good. But I saw maybe a dozen, a dozen and a half stars, little sprinkles. The brightest ones are about 12th magnitude. I did with a four inch, I was able to see the four brightest stars. Right, we'll go to the next slide now. Doug's here, right? Yep. Yeah, Doug, go ahead. I put, get you, the I, put your, I put your name on that. I don't know where it went. Oh, it's up at the top. Okay. Oh, all right. I, I knew your name was associated with it. I, I want to give credit where credit's due. That's a great image. Thanks. Did you want a couple details? Or sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, six inch uh, aperture, uh, 600 millimeter focal length. What's that? Uh, F4. Um, 80 minutes of data. Nice. What makes this cluster challenging visually is that most of those faint stars are 12th to 13th yeah. magnitude. Yeah. And, and that's a piece of cake for uh, photography. Oh, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> I'm just going to point out there's like a little letter Y right here. These two stars are not cluster members. The cluster is kind of nestled in this area. That's about 10 arc minutes across. About 200 stars down to about 15th, 16th magnitude. But I just want to point out this letter Y right there, because that was very distinct of those bright stars. We'll go to the next slide now, which I think is Mario's. Yep. And uh, yeah, there's a double, the letter Y right up there. And you notice the color of those stars. Those are yellow giants. They're, this is an old cluster. that's about a billion years old. So some of the stars are in their late stages in life. And next slide. I think we have one from uh, this Doug. Uh, yeah. You should note one thing on the previous one. Bring, oh, bring it back. The most important thing there. Look on the extreme left. There are two little galaxies. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> nice. There's the other one right there. Yeah. I think I got those Mario right. <laughs> yeah. You know what's interesting is I didn't see them at all until I tried Blur X on them, and then they suddenly appeared. Uh, that Blur X really condenses things and uh, eliminates the dispersion of light. It brings out detail. It's amazing. So those galaxies became evident uh, once I passed Blur X on it. Got to wonder the distance to that one right there. Mm, okay, we're pretty far away. away. <laughs> Thanks, Mario. All right, there's Doug. Again. And then this is the middle of Chris took this with the middleman. It's a wider yeah. field. You notice we're getting smaller. But look at how many stars are in that area. And again, you see the colors of some of those giants, orange giants right in there. And this was kind of a nice little triple right down here. My sketch is coming up next. I don't know how well it came through, but uh, the colors, there's a red giant right there. And in my sketch, again, most of this isn't going to be there, but you'll still see that letter Y right there. And this little triangle of stars and these two bright stars that bracket it. We'll go to the next slide. It should show the sketch. I don't know how well it came out. It came out pretty good. Not bad. So it took, it took some doing, but I got it. You see the letter Y right up about the middle, and there's that triangle of stars right down here. This, again, was a sketch, and if I recall, it was pretty, it's not fun to sketch a, an open star cluster when it's like, it was below freezing that particular night, <laughs> and you got to get all these stars and get them in the right place. So I wasn't, it actually started to get a little bit hazy up. So I, luckily for me, because there probably is another dozen stars I could have put in there, and I probably wouldn't be here because I would have lost my hand doing a frostbite. But this was a sketch made through it with a 10 inch telescope, nine millimeter navel. So that's about 141 power, half degree field of view, roughly. Okay, I think all well, we can preview for this month coming up. So the, and it's NGC 2024, the Flame Nebula. It's right near El Nitec. That's the lowest star in the belt of Orion. The horse head is down here. And this one's right over here. And it's fairly large. It's about seventh magnitude. It's about the size of the full moon. So this is going to be a tough nut to crack for us visual observers because you're going to have the light from this star right here, right in your face. Um, I understand that our former friend uh, Steve O'Meara, a former uh, member of the club, has seen this with Richfield Telescope and with binoculars, but what he does is with the binoculars, he'd step where there was a building. He'd find the eave of a building to block out the star, and then you can see it with binoculars. So it might be visible with a Richfield Telescope if you block out. Other than that, it's going to be kind of tough. You might want a, a nebula filter sometime. To yeah, to I was going it. to say, it's an emission nebula, so you may want to try, if you've got a UHC filter, um, that might be that might be very helpful in spotting this, but I think it really needs a dark sky. 
you can't, you, I don't know that you'll see this from around here. Um, it's like Glenn said, it's big. Um, but you know, you've got, you've got the light from this guy right here, you're yeah. in trouble. Um, it might be, it might be fun to try and see if you can see that dark lane in there. Um, if you're from a, if you're under a dark sky and the, I put a picture that Mario took. Um, Mario, was, was that your 32 inch? Uh, yes, that's with the 32. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> um, that well, that's not how you're going to see it visually. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. or, maybe but, Stephen O'Meara could. Maybe. Oh, you know him. He said he's maybe. EOI. The, um, the stars that run across the top here are about 11th magnitude. These, these little stars, this one and that one and that one, and this one too, I think is about 11th or 12th magnitude. So uh, that's my plan is to actually try to find the star field first and then start to figure out how to see the nebulosity. Um, I'll probably travel to some darker skies than Framingham, but um, that's my plan. Can we go back to Doug Paul's sure. image for a second? Doug, yes. uh, question. You've got a huge dynamic range in there. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was shot with uh, well, my usual 16-inch aperture, uh, the Canon RA uh, body. Uh, what, uh, that's the 600 millimeter f4 lens. Uh, that's five hours of data in there, uh, all two minute subs, uh, and you know, that that adds up to to give the dynamic range, I guess. But yeah, with the well, I think it's Almatac, uh, the bright star just to the right of of, of a flame. There is uh, well, you can see how it blooms. It's uh, extremely bright. Uh, and in fact, controlling that blooming is one of the challenges. Image. Very nice. Who are you impressed with? Thanks. Uh, I, I agree. It, it is one of my best. But, and uh, uh, I shot it now, what, about 10 times? Uh, and this one was worth putting in the extra hours. Before we go further, just a, a question for our new members. Are you I, I observers? Heard that, Bruce, any louder. <laughs> are you a backyard observers or more just astronomy enthusiasts? The second. the second one. Okay, so don't get overwhelmed by this. <laughs> yeah, some of these things are pretty. Some of these things are pretty hard to find. Um, they're they're faint, and they're, it's a, it's a, an observer's challenge for a good reason. Um, so yeah, be, be brave. Yeah, but if you ever want to see Saturn and things like that, I mean, we have a clubhouse here, we have observing sessions, so just get a hold of some member of the club, we'd be glad to show you, give you a little bit of a preview of what's in the night sky. Yeah, that's, that's a tough uh, object for visual observers, but yeah. uh, a good one for uh, uh, photographers. We'll still give it a try. Sure. You want to go back one more time? Back one, please. Uh, okay. Yeah, so below the flame down is the, the horse kind of thing. That's it, right here. That's oh, the horse, that's the horse and the yeah. horse head nebula is uh, uh, an incredible challenge for visual observers. Also, yes. there's some there's some rumor that an H beta filter will enhance it, but you st I think you still need a really dark sky to see that. I've never seen it. I've been doing this 50 years, and I've never seen it. Yeah. The, the pink behind it is uh, that's hydrogen emission, and the horse head itself is a dust cloud in front of it. Similarly, with the flame, uh, that's a reflection off uh, Almatac. And then the, the dark lanes are again dust in front of it. As a, as, a, as a consolation prize in this area, if you can't see the flame nebula or the horsehead nebula, um, go over here to this star here. This is Sigma Orionis. Mm. And that is a fabulous star to look at. Um, a nice multiple star with some a very beautiful uh, a sprinkle of stars around it. That is a really pretty object, Sigma. And, and the star, I mean, Almatac again, uh, yes. Double. That's the leftmost star of Orion's belt, so oh. that should make it easy to find the region. And that's a, that's a nice double star, by the way. It's fairly close. I'm going to say second, fourth magnitude and about two or three arc second separation. So uh, the one time I saw it, I think I used a six inch telescope. It might be a challenge for smaller scopes than that, but that's a nice double star. They're all over the place in there. All right. But we're... wait, there's more. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask Corey to bring up the lights a little bit. Don't go anywhere. Um, this could be bad. Brian, Brian Skiff, you're with us tonight, right? Yes, I am. There he is. Brian, uh, you're out in Flagstaff this evening, aren't you? That's right. Perfect. Brian had something to do with what I'm about to tell you. Um, uh, Dave Biker, are you here with us tonight? 
Well, maybe not. Dave wasn't sure he could make it tonight. Brian, thank you for being here with us. Um, you know, as president of the club, you know, we, we have our meetings and we have to worry about this and that and, you know, all sorts of things. And I was very happy to be president of the club. It was a really, it was a great honor. Um, but as I was winding down my tour of duty, so to speak, um, I was talking to this guy one day back in the spring, and he mentioned to me that he was uh, about to write his last article for Astronomy Magazine. And that would be published in the December issue. The January issue was awfully sad. I didn't see your article. and sad for everyone either. Nope. Um, so I wondered to myself, as president of the club, if there was something I couldn't do or could do to, to maybe honor Glenn's 20-year career at Astronomy Magazine. And so I contacted Dave Iker back at Astronomy Magazine with um, uh, the subject of my email was a fresh idea. And Dave put me in touch with Brian Skiff, who's here tonight. I keep looking up at the screen expecting to see you, Brian. I, have, I should look right here into the camera. But um, uh, Brian liked the idea. And um, uh, as it turns out, Brian discovered an asteroid um, back in 1984, which had the designation 11831, 1984 SF3. And Brian was gracious enough to offer that um, uh, asteroid to my diabolical plan. I wrote a citation, sent it to Brian. He wrote up a proposal and sent it to the uh, International Astronomical Union's Meyer Planet Center. And the wheels began to turn. There he is. Hey, Brian, now you're full screen. Thank you, Chris. Um, and then the wheels began to turn. And I'm happy to report, I'm happy to report, that everything worked out just beautifully because on December 12th, uh, just this past month, the International Astronomical Union changed the designation of that, of that asteroid to, be, to read 11831 Chapel um, after one chapel. So, <laughs> So, of course, I like fanfare, so I decided I would make a plaque. Everybody needs a plaque, right? And there's quite a story behind this plaque. I'll share it with you some other time. There, all I'll say tonight is you're only as strong as your weakest link. Come on, So, this is what's on the plaque. So, oh, let's go back to this, if we can just... Yeah. Sorry, Brian, I'm going to shrink you down again. That's right. No, I thought I got it. It's up there, but it's, I stopped the pen and now it's reversed still. Uh oh. Well, it gives me a chance to read it. <clears throat> Here, look this way. Okay, hold on. I have to look this way to read it. Oh, there we go. So this is what's on the plaque. So there's the asteroid name up at the top there. The citation that I wrote read, Glenn Chapel, born 1947, is an American popularizer of astronomy. He is best known for his 20-year career as a contributing editor for Astronomy Magazine. As a member of the AABSO, he has submitted over 80,000 visual estimates of variable stars. He served as president from 2015 to 2018 of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. An asteroid 11831 uh, 1984 SF3 was discovered by Brian Skiff on September 28, 1984, and was officially named Chapel by the IAU's Working Group for Small Bodies Nomenclature on December 12, 2022. And I would, it is my great honor and pleasure to present you with this, with this plaque. Um, well, welcome to us. Welcome to us. Get close. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Brian, do you, do you want to chime in? Do you want to talk about anything about your asteroid? And Well, um, maybe uh, it's uh, the best way to start is to say that this was uh, one of many discoveries that we made with using the Pluto camera, the 13-inch astrograph that was used to discover Pluto, which we ran uh, the last time it was used to do any scientific observing was in the 1980s through the whole decade of the 80s. And uh, this was one of about 50 asteroids that I discovered that are actually attributed to me. I think we ended up finding about 2,500 new asteroids during that work. Um, and uh, we've, you know, of course the surveying, we're, we're out of the survey biz right now, but uh, in, the, in the aughts, we ran a near earth asteroid survey with a, a, a small Schmidt camera where we discovered about 30,000 new asteroids. Um, but with the Pluto camera, 
the amount of real estate and how faint we could go uh, was relatively limited on the photographic plates. And so the, the numbers were less impressive. But this is one of those, and it's one of the, I think it's the lowest numbered one of the ones that, I, that have not been named or hitherto not been named uh, uh, that are amongst my discoveries. So this was one of the objects that we found during that during that work in the 1980s. Unfortunately, I have to say it was 40 years ago, and we've we're both Glenn and I are still here, which is good news. <laughs> well, again, I appreciate um, you giving up your asteroid and, and helping us out with this. Um, if it weren't for you, we would have never. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been able to get it through to the IAU. So thank you, thank you. Uh, oh, for, pleased to uh, do so, and pleased to see Glenn. I haven't seen Glenn and probably those 40 years either and so and we go back a ways i used to write a, i wrote a column on double status for this magazine called deep sky magazine, oh yeah biker edited and you took it over for me <laughs> yeah. it's a new beginning i guess for the column there so there's nice. an opening now at astronomy magazine if you feel like writing yeah <laughs> dave Iker pings me about it every now and then <laughs> hey thank you you're quite welcome well, there you go, Glenn. You've got your own asteroid now, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a nice way. It, I, it, it, it beats a pen, and, a pen set from, from Dave and, and the folks who was talking about <laughs> um, I think, yeah. um, because this sort of immortalizes you and the work that you did. Um, so it, one, can, one, uh, one thing I might mention uh, for you folks while, while we were waiting here, I actually looked up uh, an ephemeris for the asteroid, and uh, it's rather faint now, um, but it'll be coming around to opposition next fall it'd be about um uh, about 17th magnitude next october and november in uh, aries near opposition so it'll be relatively easy to pick up again photographically and i also found that there's a uh, a, a light curve for it that's published rotation period fairly slow rotation period of about 32 hours which was done uh from data from the palomar transit factory that was the you you saw about the the ZTF, which is the Zicky Zwicky transient factory, but this was the precursor to that, where they took um, lots of images using the 48 inch Schmidt at Palomar, um, and so they, they collected data from that. Uh, someone went through and trawled through to grab asteroid light curves, and uh, Glenn's was was one of them. Nice. It's a main belt asteroid, and and yes. And you know, uh, Brian, I I, um, I asked our our Middleman Observatory team if they could acquire an image of that asteroid. You had no idea why I was asking about that particular <laughs> asteroid, um, <laughs> because I was trying to keep this all a, a, a deep secret. Um, unfortunately, like that first slide we showed, but we have to do that at the clubhouse because the Middleman Observatory uh, couldn't access the asteroid so low in the southwest. Oh, okay. But yes, it, it comes to opposition this fall, and we'll make sure we get an image for you. Nice. Um, so uh, again, Brian, uh, thank you so much for all of your help with this, and um, and uh, I, I, it's much appreciated. Thank you very much. And Glenn, again, congratulations. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. I'm not gonna give a long speech because we have three speakers, but I did wanna say one thing <laughs> looking at this. Um, I think of these, the three things I mentioned is writing for a magazine for 20 years, 80,000 variable stuff, but the one I think about this, I thought of what, my, what have I accomplished in you know, the years I've been observing, but as the three years I served as pleasant, president of this club, I think seriously it's the accomplishment, if you want to call it that, that I'm proud of. This is a great organization, and to have served as your president is just a, it's an honor that I'll take with me the rest of my life. So uh, thank you very much. Bruce, thank you, and thank you all too. And by the way, keep looking up. I was, I was, I, uh, I, what I would have added to the plaque, um, the, the citation, um, Brian, when Brian told me the citation had to be 300 characters or less, I, I thought he, I, I said, that can't be right. He must mean words. No, no, he meant characters. So it was pretty challenging to summarize somebody's, um, you know, career in astronomy with 300 characters. And I was going to put how, about how handsome you are and how, <laughs> how, how much you like to fish. But I ran out of uh, characters. I'm, I'm sorry, next time. And one other thing, I did see the list of people who got this. Uh, you can also get an asteroid named after if you're a rock star and uh, or a musician. Dolly Parton was in that same batch. Yep. She's, she has her own asteroid, too. That's right. And there, there, the, about a month or so before, 
there was an asteroid named Richard Nugent. But that's not me. <laughs> Remember the speaker we had two Septembers ago, Richard Nugent from, yep. the, uh, from Houston, the International Occultation guy? Yeah. Um, that, that's him. He had, had got an asteroid for, primarily for his work that he did for NASA. And so, um, I, but don't, th that's not me. And, and the asteroid Nugent, that's Carrie Nugent. Remember her from September? Yeah, that's her asteroid. So, I, so yeah, but now you have one too. Thank you. Cool. All right, you guys. Thanks very much, everyone. So now you get to Glenn, you. next, next Glenn, call, I'll be happy to take a picture and show you. Actually, yes, we bring it home. <laughs> What's that, Mario? Yeah, I said oh. next fall, uh, come on over. We'll take it together. Sounds like a plan. Perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, you have to do outreach. I'll just stay right up here. Yeah. All right, it's time for outreach now. So. Next up, we'll uh, get to our members' talks. First up is Joseph Rothschild. Uh, his talk is titled, A Quest for Southern Skies, My Trip to Chile During a Pandemic. So after retiring in 2020, Joseph wanted to travel to see Southern Skies. After some research and a two-year delay due to COVID, he traveled to Chile in late February 2022, and we'll discuss the process of planning the trip, as well as his experience in Chile. Joseph Rothschild, is a excuse me, Joseph Rothschild is a retired primary care physician, physician, sorry, physician, and he got his telescope, first telescope at age 13. He joined the Bond Astronomical Club in the 1960s, he joined Atmom in 1986 at the time of Halley's Comet, and was a past president of Atmob. He is primarily a visual observer, particularly of deep sky, planetary, solar, and variable stars. So first, I'd like to say that uh, I was looking forward to giving this talk in person, uh, but uh, maybe it's fitting that uh, just before giving the talk, I developed COVID. When my talk is, in fact, about taking a trip during the pandemic, I did not get COVID during, during the trip to Chile. So uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I had, um, have, uh, I had retired January 1st of 2020, just prior to the pandemic. And my big uh, hope was to, to uh, do a lot of travel and specifically take a dedicated astronomy trip uh, to uh, for Southern Skies. So in the past, I have seen some Southern Skies uh, during just regular, regular travel. I went to Peru, uh, brought some binoculars along, and I uh, did a trip to Tahiti, uh, where I brought a small travel scope. But I was really interested in getting a better familiarity with Southern Skies and having access to uh, uh, larger instruments. Um, in the past, I had gone to some astronomy inns in the United States, uh, the Skywatcher Inn in Arizona and Star Hill Inn in New Mexico, and really enjoyed these. You could stay there. Uh, there were meals served, and you could rent uh, good-sized telescopes. Um, unfortunately, these are these are all have closed. None of them are available, and so I was trying to figure out whether there was anything in this uh, in the southern hemisphere that would be the equivalent. So, at one of the last uh, ATMOB meetings prior to the pandemic, I talked to uh, Kelly Beatty, and he was very helpful. Um, uh, and, and basically, the, the criteria that I uh, had was I wanted to go as far south as possible, have dark skies, obviously no clouds, dry season, new moon, uh, room and board, be able to rent a telescope, uh, and ideally was planning something in February or March, um, which is a period where both the Magellanic Clouds and Omega Centauri would be uh, easily observed. Uh, so when I talked to Kelly, uh, he he talked to me about two specific places in Chile. Uh, one was Space Ops, which is in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. Um, now, they have some uh, large uh, telescopes that can be rented, um, and there's nearby lounge, uh, lodging. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to cook your meals yourself, which also means you need a car to go shopping. And I was trying to avoid that. Then he told me about the Hacienda Los Andes, in, uh, also in northern Chile, not quite as far north as uh, Space Ops, uh, where it's a hacienda, 18 rooms, 
room and board. It's 30 degrees south latitude, uh, 300 clear nights per year. They have uh, very uh, uh, good telescopes to rent, including a 12 and a half inch portable, 10 inch teleport, and a 200 millimeter tech refractor. Uh, for imagers, they also have a 14 and a 20 inch uh, Richard Credian. Uh, but again, I was more interested in the in the uh, uh, visual. Um, as a backup, I was thinking about the Southern Sky Party, which was a tour uh, organized by Travel Quest in the past. Um, it's in uh, Costa Rica, which is uh, obviously not as far south, uh, and they don't have any telescopes to rent. So that was sort of a backup in case this others these other trips didn't work out. So this is uh, just a picture of the uh, from the uh, space obs, which is near San Pedro de Atacama. Again, you can see a whole array of uh, different uh, uh, visual instruments. Uh, but I decided on the Hacienda Los Andes, uh, partly because, again, they uh, both have very nice rooms to rent, good food, and uh, good telescopes. Uh, they also, in addition to having astronomy, uh, so they also specialize in horseback riding, which wasn't something I was going to participate in, but it was interesting. The Hacienda was uh, created by Daniel Bershatz, who is a Belgian uh, astrophotographer, um, along with his wife, Patricia Salgado, who's uh, from Chile. Uh, sadly, he, uh, uh, Daniel had died in 2017. So she's actually been running this on her own um, uh, since that time. So the, as I was planning, initially I was hoping to go in February of uh, 2021, but uh, Chile was completely closed to foreigners until November, 2021. Um, it did then open at that time, uh, but if you came, you had to have a PCR test in the airport and you couldn't leave the airport until it was negative, until the results came back. Uh, which made making any connecting flights uh, challenging. Um, you also needed a mobility pass uh, with, to prove your vaccination status. Um, now, fortunately, as I was getting close to the time when I wanted to go, which now had been changed to February of 2022, um, they did change the requirements so that you took a PCR COVID test in the airport uh, but you could travel on to your hotel, wherever that is, um, and then just wait at the hotel uh, until you got a negative result. So again, the, there were considerable overall COVID requirements. Uh, again, the mobility pass, you needed a COVID PCR within 72 hours of departure, the COVID test in the airport, and then to return, you needed another PCR test uh, within three days of the return flight, which is a little challenging in rural Chile. Um, and you also needed a rapid test within one day of uh, return to the U.S. for the uh, United States requirements. Um, additionally, there's a requirement for a daily COVID check-in, basically check in on a, on a phone app um, and indicate that you don't have any COVID symptoms. Um, and if there was any thought about ignoring this, I heard from someone else who was staying at the at the uh, hacienda was a professor um, who was doing a semester abroad in Santiago, um, and some of his students neglected to do the app every day, and the police showed up at their dorm. So the the Chilean uh, government was taking this very seriously. Um, then there was an additional challenge with a mobility pass, which is that the website where you sign on initially was only in Spanish. And so that was quite a challenge for me since I do not speak Spanish. It took up to six weeks to, to get the pass. You first have to establish your identity with your passport, upload your vaccine card, and then upload your PCR test three days before you leave. Um, and also you had to, um, you, you were not supposed to book your airline tickets until you had the mobility pass. Uh, but that meant that that was getting pretty close to when you were uh, going to be leaving. But I did get my mobility pass, uh, which I was very pleased with. Um, and this is just a picture of the app, the COVID app that I filled out every day while I was uh, 
uh, in Chile. So I made my reservations to go on February 28th of last year, uh, arranged a ground transfer from La Serena uh, Airport um, to take me to the Hacienda, uh, planned five nights of observing. Uh, so the only thing else I had to do uh, was to make an observing list. So uh, I started, sort of my starting point was this article in Astronomy Magazine in May of 2021 on uh, the southern sky. Uh, so there's a nice list of some of the uh, uh, real uh, uh, key objects um, and then built it up uh, from there. I uh, put together a spreadsheet uh, that was organized by Right Ascension, similar to how you do a, a messy marathon. I thought that I uh, uh, would have everything organized to see during the course of the, of the evening. Uh, now, meanwhile, as I'm waiting for my flight on the 28th, I'm also noticing the COVID levels in Chile, which peaked just two weeks before I got there. Fortunately, in that two weeks, it, it did come down to a more manageable level. Um, so this is just a, a picture of a uh, map of northern Chile uh, showing uh, La Serena. So Santiago, the capital, is to the south. And I took a flight from from uh, Santiago up to La Serena, and then drove down to the Hacienda Los Andes in Hurtado, which you can see on the lower right. Uh, and you also can see uh, uh, a graphic of, a, uh, of an observatory nearby. So here are some Google Maps. Um, and on the first panel, you can see the Hacienda, oh, sorry. You can see the Hacienda down here in the valley. And up here, are three observatories, which are better seen in the in the uh, the middle panel. This is the uh, Vera Rubin, which is still under construction. Um, uh, this is Gemini South, a very large instrument, and the Southern uh, Astrophysical Research Telescope here. Uh, and then this is only five miles from the Hacienda. Now the Hacienda is in the valley, and the telescopes are on top of the mountain. Um, an additional five miles north um, is Cerro Tololo. So the Hacienda is in very good company. Um, and on the right panel, you can see this is a picture of the Hacienda. And then below it uh, are all of the domes and uh, uh, telescope pads uh, for the observing area. It's about a 10 minute walk up a, up a hill from uh, where, where I was gonna be staying. So I boarded my flight, Boston to Atlanta, to Santiago, to La Serena. Uh, this was a very nice site in the, in the uh, Santiago airport, uh, which told me I was heading in the right direction. Um, then flew into uh, La Serena, is the airport there. Um, and this is the road from La Serena to Hurtado. Uh, and very aptly named the route of the stars. So again, I was feeling uh, again, that I was in the, in going to the right place. Um, interestingly, this is also the area where the uh, one of the Chilean eclipses were, and they had upgraded this highway uh, to prepare for crowds coming uh, to the eclipse. Um, along the way, on two locations, I was able to see uh, some of the observatories in a distance. This is the Ver Vera Rubin Observatory uh, being constructed. Uh, I also saw uh, the dome of uh, Gemini South. And finally, we're at the Hacienda, uh, which is a lovely place. Again, about 18 rooms, uh, very nice setting. And uh, here is uh, the dining area where I had the breakfast and my room is on the right. Uh, and this is the view from, from my room. So it's very nice accommodations. When I was there, it was actually, it was interesting because it was in February, but that was their, basically like their Labor Day. So people were all going back to school. And uh, so it was crowded the, the week before, but the week I was there for most of it, it was myself and there was a couple uh, who were eight months pregnant and had come to the Hacienda for their last, final uh, fling before the birth. Um, 
So I had most of the time I had the uh, Hacienda mostly to myself. Uh, there was a group of uh, uh, people doing a documentary that came later in the in the week. Uh, they were coming to film a nearby remote observatory. So they stayed for a couple of days. Um, and then on the last, on the fifth night, uh, the, the professor from Santiago, who I mentioned, uh, was there. Um, I ate well, had some Chilean wine, empanadas, uh, and basically breakfast was included. And then uh, lunch and dinner was really a very nominal fee. Um, and very good. Uh, there were some nice hikes during the during the day. Uh, you can see there's a river trail and then an upper trail uh, in the hills. Um, on the river trail, there was also a 2.3 kilometer solar system model. So here's the sun at the beginning of the trail. Um, and then uh, at, at appropriate intervals, uh, this was uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So that was how I, I spent my days was doing some, some hiking. Um, and then also, this is the way up to the observatory. Um, and uh, you can see on the upper right, oops, sorry. The upper right uh, is a, um, a warming room. There's all, this is also a roll off that I, uh, I think was for imaging. Uh, and you can see in the, in the warming room are some uh, very uh, impressive uh, images from Daniel Vershots, who, had, who again had founded the Hacienda. Here are some of the other domes up on the up on the hill, um, and this was a um, a sundial and a, and a memorial uh, to Daniel Bershatz. So this was the uh, twelve and a half inch portable, which was the instrument I mostly used on a nice uh, concrete uh, pad. Uh, this is Elke, Elke Schultz who is a German astroimager. Uh, she uh, used to work full-time and now uh, was just managing the instruments of the, uh, uh, of the Hacienda. So she set up the telescopes every night. Um, and this is the 200 millimeter tech uh, that I used one of the nights that I was there. Uh, they also use this instrument to do star tours for other guests. Uh, and then this was the 10 inch teleport um, that I was hoping to use, uh, and the, she had set it up for me, and I came up and looked at it. Um, unfortunately, when I came back that night for observing, the wind had blown it over, and it was severely out of collimation, so I ended up using the teleport again. So now it was, uh, the sun was setting, um, and uh, one thing you'll notice is a reddish hue in the, in the sky, uh, this was one month after the Tonga volcano had erupted. Um, and I was told that some of what we were seeing was dust and ash from the from the volcano. So the skies were clear. I actually had basically four and a half nights of clear skies, but there was some uh, uh, ash from the volcano. And this is why I this is why I came. So basically seeing the the uh, Southern uh, Milky Way and, and obviously the Magellanic Clouds, the large and small Magellanic Clouds, 47 Tucani, Colsac, Eta Carinae, Southern Pleiades, here's the Southern Cross. And so I, I really had you know, five wonderful nights there. Uh, three of them I observed with the telescopes, two with large binoculars. It was sometimes nice just to lie lie on a lounger and, and, and look up at the sky and really get familiar with the southern sky. Uh, I just, um, in closing, wanted to share some of my the most memorable views. So Omega Satori rising. So every evening, uh, about an hour after I started observing, um, I could see Omega Centauri. So here's Alpha and Beta Centauri, and here's Omega Centauri rising over the hill. Uh, and it was really a beautiful view. I actually um, preferred it in, uh, I wasn't expecting to, but I preferred the view in binoculars 
just striking to see to see it rising. Um, although obviously, I also observed with the uh, uh, with the uh, telescopes as well. Uh, the Magellanic clouds. Obviously, we all, we all go to see southern skies to see the Magellanic clouds. Uh, similarly, I, I have to say that. Uh, the view of the large Magellanic cloud through binoculars where you can in, in see the entire galaxy in one view um, was actually the most striking, um, although exploring it, looking at tarantula nebula and other parts was, uh, was also wonderful. Um, some, uh, some of the times I got up in the middle of the night uh, and it was wonderful to see Sagittarius it wasn't quite overhead, it was about 50 degrees up in the sky. Scorpius was overhead. Um, and really get a sense of, of, being, of it being a galaxy, the, the, the Milky Way, seeing the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and a little later, you could see Venus rising. Uh, and uh, just a hint of zodiacal light here around Venus. I wasn't able to see it visually, but in, in the picture, uh, you can see it here. I have to say that the unexpected view, which I had was uh, involved in Carini. So this is a, uh, this is a uh, view of Eta Carini, an image that I took through eye telescope uh, using their instrument. This was a while back, uh, their instrument in Sliding Spring, Australia. Um, uh, and just you know, perusing in a Carina with a, the Carina Nebula with with uh, the telescope was wonderful. Uh, but it was then pointed out to me that around this Eta Carina itself, uh, the homunculus, which you can see here in a Hubble image, um, that this is actually was visible both in the twelve inch and in the eight, eight inch scopes. Um, you could see the hourglass shape of the homunculus and. Uh, uh, I was really pleased to, to, to learn about it and to see it. So about a couple of nights. So uh, again, this was a very memorable trip, which I encouraged other people to consider uh, uh, trying. Uh, does it uh, did involve some planning, uh, involved a lot of patience and perseverance, but it was well worth it. Um, now, recently, I received this advertisement for my telescope. And it turns out this April, uh, they're having an astro imaging masterclass um, at the Hacienda. So anyone who's interested in imaging and going to Southern skies, you may want to consider it. Uh, Elke Schultz, who I showed you, I think is one of the people uh, teaching the class. Um, and this is you know, fairly reasonable. This does not include the airfare. I will point out that my trip including airfare, room and board, three meals, COVID tests, renting the telescopes, uh, the total was about $3,600. So as trips go, it was actually quite uh, uh, quite reasonable uh, and, and I encourage other people to consider it. So any questions? A question from Tom. Joe, what did you think of the uh, culture and the people and how they treat you? Treat uh, everybody was, was lovely. Uh, there was actually only one or two people in the Hacienda who spoke English, uh, uh, but everybody uh, uh, was, was really very, very helpful and um, yeah, I, just a very positive impression. Oh, and, and one other thing I will mention, um, uh, Patricia Salgado, who owns the Hacienda, uh, did mention while I was there that she's, uh, because of the challenges of running this on her own, she's actually trying to sell it. So if anyone is interested in <laughs> spending a million and a half dollars and having as much Southern skies as you'd ever want to have, um, yeah. and, and great, uh, 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 observatory, uh, you can contact me and I'll tell you how to get in touch with her. So. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. It's like an awesome trip.
yeah, hopefully it can encourage some people to maybe try to plan their own trip sometime. So it's, it's on my bucket list for sure to see the southern sky. And uh, next up, we'll have Kai Kai, and he'll be talking about the Clay Center Observatory. Kai will review the history of the Clay Center Observatory at Dexter Southfield, an independent school. He'll also talk about the 25-inch telescope in the observatory and the ongoing observatory docking program. The highlight of the presentation will be the mirror cleaning project they just completed right before Christmas. Kai Kai has a PhD in astrophysics. He joined ATMOB three years ago and is serving as member at large. He recently joined Dexter Southfield as a as a sorry as an upper school astronomy teacher. So it may take a few moments to switch over to change cables and whatnot. So please bear with us. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, uh, I mean, to have a chance to be able to share my uh, my experience at the uh, uh, Clay Center Observatory. Um, so uh, I joined the uh, the faculty of Dexter Southfield uh, just uh, last of September. Um, so this is uh, a picture I took of the observatory from uh, it's. Uh, on the fifth floor of the Clay Center, so that's why it's called Clay Center Observatory. And uh, this is a picture I took of the observatory the, of the dome, as you can see here. Um, so I'll um, uh, first uh, talk a little bit about history of the observatory, and then uh, about telescopes and our docent program. Uh, yeah, so this word. Uh, uh, like even my daughter, who's native speaker, uh, is also new to, to her. Uh, and uh, I'll focus on, I'll, I'll highlight the, the mirror cleaning project that uh, uh, Alan and his son completed uh, just uh, before the holidays. And then uh, last, we'll talk about a little bit about uh, the future work, future plan. So. So this is um, a nice uh, picture um, of the uh, Clay Center, entire Clay Center. So the, um, the observatory is located on top of the building. And uh, this was built in 2002 to 2003, uh, as far as I know that uh, when the, the building was built. Uh, so uh, it's uh, when Dexter Southfield uh, uh, which is an uh, independent school uh, in uh, Brookline. So some of you may uh, may been may have been there. Uh, wanted to expand to uh, to establish their upper school, which is basically high school, uh, and they uh, well obviously needed uh, uh, a high school building. Um, so uh, uh, Mr. Clay. <laughs> uh, Donated uh, uh, money to build the building, and as uh, as uh, some of you know, he has uh, he has the really uh, interest, uh, strong interest in astronomy. So he has donate, donated uh, uh, telescopes uh, in Harvard. He has established the Clay Fellowship in uh, in Harvard. Also supported. Uh, this is a Wikipedia entry. So he supported. Uh, uh, he, he wanted the, the Clay Center to have a, an observatory uh, uh, from the beginning. Right. So that's how the, um, uh, the observatory was built. So I uh, came to know this in 2018 uh, when I taught at, uh, uh, at uh, a college. Uh, so it's called Pine Manor College. It's a small college in Brookline as well. And uh, so I heard about this position, uh, a astronomy, uh, astronomy teacher position at Dexter Southfield and learned that, uh, learned about the observatory. But, but that, at that time I didn't get, the, I went to, uh, went to the interview but didn't get the position. And uh, so this is, the, the observatory was built and the telescope was built at the request of uh, 
uh, Ms. Ron Dentowitz, uh, who is uh, who served as the first directory, uh, sorry, the first director of the observatory. Uh, so uh, he was. I heard he was a friend of uh, uh, Mr. Clay, and uh, so uh, he. This is uh, his proposal uh, to build the, uh, the observatory, and he selected uh, DFN. To build to build the telescope and observatory, so this is like a custom designed uh, uh, telescope and observatory, as you can see here. Um, so it's still displayed on the FM web page, uh, website after so many years. Um, so, like this is still an active website, and showing this is like long web page. They uh, have completed this and. Uh, 20 years ago. It's just like amazing that uh, it's been, has been 20 years. Um, uh, it's a, a Cassegrain uh, telescope and uh, uh, well uh, I learned that it's uh, actually 25 inch but it's often said to be 24 inch. Um, uh, uh, so as, as you know that uh, while well, this is from uh, astronomy textbook as you know Cassegrain Tesco has uh, just to uh, in the future to uh, just in case. Uh, so there's um, uh, uh, many of you know this that uh, like there's a hole uh, in in the primary mirror to allow light to come through. Uh, so that's the leftmost one is the Cassegrain focus. Uh, one example of the Cassegrain uh, telescope is the Gemini North Morse. Uh, this is uh, one big telescope in uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Right? Uh, so uh, uh, the previous astronomy teacher is uh, uh, Dr. Philippe Santos. He actually was the one who got the the, the job in 2018, and so he started in, in 2019. Uh, judging from like they didn't wear mask. Uh, I, I think that this, my speculation is this picture was taken sometime in 2019 or early 2020, right before the pandemic. So that's a, a page, uh, that's a, like a picture still featured on the school website. Uh, so uh, I, I was able to find, uh, well, uh, a design uh, booklet uh, of, uh, of the telescope and uh, which contains many images of, uh, uh, of the different parts of the telescope and including this one. And this shows uh, the primary mirror here, that's the secondary mirror. And uh, so the diameter here shows me it, it is 25 inch instead of 24. So that's that settles the like the question. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry, this is like uh, really jumping my head. Uh, so this is the test scope and work. Uh, so you can see besides the main scope, which is 25 inch, we also have explorer finder scope, and on on the other side there is also another finder scope that to use for viewing. Uh, even though we rarely use it. You can see it's like behind here. And uh, it's uh, fully uh, computer controlled. So uh, we have this uh, uh, SkyX software. Um, one, this is actually a, just monitor. The actual computer is uh, located uh, uh, in a room underneath the dome. Uh, and this is another monitor uh, that uh, controls the dome separately. Right. So the, it's not fully automated because uh, one uh, software controls the dome, the other controls the telescope, and they don't really talk to each other. So we have to uh, just like rotate the dome where the telescope points to. Right. Uh, and uh, besides that, there's a hand panel that uh, inside, in case this uh, this won't give you the desired position, or you need to fine tune where to to to, to find the object, then you use the hand pedal. So that's 
So, um, uh, so the school um, wanted me to, besides teaching, uh, wanted me to run this so-called observatory docent program and to uh, train the students, they call them docents, to, to host uh, this public nights. As of now, we are still uh, only opening to the uh, school community. So, uh, because uh, Dexter Southfield is actually uh, contains uh, from kindergarten to to upper school, so it's a, please, uh, uh, a pretty big school community actually. Um, and uh, I recorded this uh, uh, five students uh, in September, uh, but uh, well, four of them are uh, currently uh, staying in the program. Uh, these are three, and they. Uh, they are ninth nice graders and they are all, uh, well, as I hope you can tell, there's three of them. And uh, so uh, this boy is standing up and the two girls are looking at, uh, one is looking at main scope, the other is looking at the other one. And uh, so uh, uh, when they are working, um, so uh, they, are, they are close friends and they're uh, they have they are energetic because probably because they just uh, entered upper school and uh, so it's nice to uh, be able to uh, just tap into this energy and uh, so uh, uh, they know what they are doing well generally and so uh, with me uh, like uh, we have already uh, organized uh, several. Uh, I can say successful uh, evenings. So we saw the uh, moon, we saw planets, and also uh, uh, few uh, uh, messier objects. Um, uh, well, uh, Elberio is probably one of the interesting one to get them excited. So. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the support of uh, uh, school administration, uh, but also uh, I have to uh, thank, uh, especially thank the previous astronomy teachers, uh, uh, Kelly, as you all know, and uh, uh, Philippe Santos, uh, who came back to help me, uh, to teach me how to use the task of and uh, uh, tell me some uh, troubleshooting tips that was very helpful. Okay, so from now, uh, uh, okay, so next I'll just focus on, on the cleaning project that Alan and uh, Aaron uh, completed uh, right before Christmas. Uh, so, um, so just, Serious images. Uh, first, <clears throat> uh, it's a very interesting uh, process, and uh, we were uh, lucky because those few days before Christmas were nice and uh, warm, so the temperature was in uh, 40s, right? So in lower 40s uh, or at least upper 30s. Uh, so dome temperature uh, is so warm enough so that Alan decided that we do not need to. Uh, remove the mirror cell uh, from the dome to, to the kitchen sink to, to, to clean it. And uh, so first step is uh, we had to remove this accessory uh, so, uh, which contains uh, uh, a mirror and uh, also uh, like a camera system. Right? And uh, uh, is uh, from, the, from the base of the has gold. Uh, this shows that we look through here and shows that uh, uh, it seems the secondary mirror is clean. That this looks through the hole of the primary mirror to look at the secondary mirror. Uh, so, uh, so to uh, uh, to lower the mirror cells, uh, we have to put uh, this uh, uh, mirror cell lifting assembly, uh, this long, uh, uh, long pole attached firmly to the side 
side of the telescope, side of the tube. Um, so as you can see here, uh, so see the mirror cells lifting assembly uh, or MCLA is the duration, the acronym uh, right here. And then um, uh, Alan and Aaron uh, uh, rotate the handles to uh, to lower the mirror cells. I have a, a, a video, a short video here showing the process. It has to be, they have to synchronize this to, um, so that um, the cell remain to be horizontal. No, they, those are special tools supplied by EFM. It took us a year to find them. Nobody knew what anything looked like. Do you know how heavy the mirror is? Uh, the mirror sure. is about 300 pounds. That whole assembly is closer to 400. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> the the mirror, mirror is from Brashear, isn't it? Yes. Did the anti telescope decide he visited DFM one year? Brashear another year. <laughs> okay, so. Once the mirror cell is lowered, uh, we take. I took picture, and you can see it's pretty dirty. Uh, so, uh, so we do need to uh, clean it. I'm not sure when it was it was cleaned last time. Uh, Kelly mentioned that probably 2014 or 2018. Last time he was there, uh, they did some clean, but yeah. <laughs> After that, I don't know. Um, so uh, this is the setup. So uh, that since we're going to clean the mirror in the dome, uh, so we put a bucket here for water and also uh, a piece of pool <laughs> around it just to for the water uh, uh, for any water uh, leaking uh, and uh, leak into it. Um, so just to keep the the dome floor dry. Um, and uh, well, uh, 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 first time the soapy water was used, um, and then uh, 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 rinsed, rinsed with uh, distilled water, um, and uh, uh, the third round uh, using alcohol. Um, so uh, I actually look at uh, a, a post, discussion post on the Edmob forum that uh, uh, someone posted a web page about uh, uh, cleaning the mirror process. Uh, usually just if you are satisfied with uh, the alcohol, uh, well, rinse with alcohol, then it's done. Uh, but when we look at it, Alan decided that it's not uh, very satisfactory, so uh, he uh, used the uh, distilled water to rinse, it, rinse it again, uh, just just as the last step. And now you can see the mirror is pretty clean, and uh, you can see the reflection from like different parts of the telescope in the reflection. So, um, so glad that this is done and. Uh, one thing, one last thing before um, and this uh, talk about this is that uh, Alan and Aaron found that there should be, uh, uh, we have located two baffles that should be there, but it's not in the telescope. Uh, so one of them is being installed back just to prevent street light uh, to get in, uh, get in. So uh, get into the main tube. So that's one thing we, we were able to like fix uh, and to improve this task um, And uh, okay, so for future work, uh, I think we, uh, Alan did try to do some uh, uh, collimation. Uh, this is, this picture is showing that, but of course we, really need to look at the images at night, look at uh, star images at, at night to uh, 
to look at, uh, uh, to, to see, to check if the telescope is really collimated or not. Um, and uh, one thing uh, we have discovered is that the mirror, mirror in the mirror cells, one side is, um, is uh, in touch with the, one of the pins, the other is, is like a little bit out of touch. So it means that the center of the mirror is not completely aligned with the center of the telescope. Um, so we're not sure right now whether this is deliberately done just because um, <coughs> to achieve some special effect or this is just uh, a mistake or something. Mistake made by uh, someone who, who, who did, who assembled this last time. Okay, so before the holidays, I also ordered some, something uh, like some uh, eyepieces so that uh, when in future uh, open, uh, we call it open Tesco nights, I, we, uh, we, have, we could have more choices in, in looking at, uh, I haven't uh, tried all this yet, but uh, uh, well, uh, I guess uh, I could have some fun with the bottle lens and, and etc. So that's like, and these are also a set of filters, uh, visual filters. Uh, just say if you're looking at the full moon, then you can uh, block some of the, uh, use, well, different colors or even block some of the uh, uh, bright light. Deal water, another polarizing filter, just to block some, like the strong, say, Light from full moon. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Arnie uh, approached me. Uh, Arnie Hendon from ABSO approached me uh, just over weekend, um, asking me if uh, uh, that we would have we would like to uh, add this 25 inch to ABSO net. Uh, but first, we need to. Uh, automate the telescope more, uh, as I just mentioned earlier, that uh, the dome uh, and the telescope, the software controlling the telescope, are not uh, uh, really connected. So that uh, when the telescope is pointing to a certain position, the dome cannot, like we have to manually rotate dome to 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 open to to open the slit that uh, the telescope is pointing to. So, um, so that's probably the first step, and also we need to. So far, we uh, since I joined uh, Dexter uh, Source Field, we have only used it for visual uh, observing. Uh, so we haven't uh, tried with the camera to take images. So, um, so all of this has to be completed before, uh, I guess, or to figure out somehow before we join AS, ASO net. So, uh, well, that's uh, some uh, little experience I, I would like to share with uh, everyone. And uh, I'm still learning about this. And I'm not trained as an as observational astronomer, so, um, so I have much to learn from, from a lot of you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, uh, somebody has, Gerald has their hand up. Hi, yeah. uh, uh, Dexter Southfield used to have an astronomy day in the summer. Uh, is that sort of perhaps going to happen again? Do we know? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Actually, I, I didn't know that they, would, they used to have astronomy, an astronomy day. So uh, I heard that, uh, yeah, it's a, a little bit um, sad because um, uh, when I uh, came in, I uh, I found that the, the room underneath the dome is full of stuff. Some uh, irrelevant to astronomy. Some are just uh, like a storage for summer camp stuff. Uh, but uh, the others are some of the some are equipment from 
uh, Mr. Ron Dentowitz, uh and left. Uh, I'm not sure why he didn't uh, uh, clear that room out with his personal stuff, some maybe his personal stuff. Um, and uh, so uh, I heard a lot about uh, the 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 heydays, maybe. <laughs> and uh, but I I guess uh, uh, what happened? I heard what happened is that the, the upper school has expanded. Now we have more students, and uh, so the space is like used to be. Uh, Kelly told me that it used to be that uh, they have a observer's room on the fourth floor and that uh, he or uh, Ron could uh, s like uh, sleep at night in that observer room, but now it's used in as an office. So like every space, uh, for a fourth floor and uh, storage space on the fifth floor are being used. So uh, because the school expansion. So, uh, but as a result, a lot of interesting uh, maybe also because of the pandemic, uh, also a lot of uh, interesting activities have, have been stopped or uh, people left, and, and etc. So, uh, so that's uh, that's the status. Hey, can I can I, uh, can I maybe address that a little bit? Okay. Um, so, in in the heyday, as Kai was mentioning, uh, it was really an amazing thing, as some of you remember, and that mob certainly supported Astronomy Day. But it took a tremendous amount of resources from the school uh, over time for the staff, for the janitors, setting up the, we had to clear out the cafeteria and so forth. And ultimately, I would say maybe six years ago, the school decided that it just wasn't worth doing anymore. And that kind of put Astronomy Day, at least in terms of Boston, and in, in limbo. Uh, a year or two ago, we tried doing it at uh, Bob Finney's uh, New England SciTech out out in um, uh, I think it's in Natick, and it's it's just a, not a really good spot as as it, nice as as Bob is to host it. It's just very hard to get to. I am happy to say that you might many of you know that the um, Boston Public Library has taken twelve of our library telescopes, and I've been negotiating with them about the idea of doing Astronomy Day on Copley Square, uh, where the main branch of the Boston Public Library is. In, in uh, On paper, it's a fantastic opportunity. We could use the library for lectures. We could have solar observing on Copley Square by day and uh, uh, nighttime observing on Copley Square at night. Obviously, it's a light polluted situation, but you know my mantra is you go where the people are. And uh, so maybe for this coming April, it's, we're starting to run out of time, but um, I know there's enthusiasm on the part of the uh, Boston Public Library staff, so we'll just have to see where that goes. Don't schedule it for during NEEF. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you it won't be scheduled for NEEF because when NEEF happens, I'm going to be in Australia. It won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, just to let you know, the last time the mirror was cleaned was in 2016. Oh, I see. Um, and Thank there you. are a, a, a few volunteers that um, from AtMob that were around for a long time. I volunteered there from 2005 to 2018. Wow. Um, had uh, telescope nights for the general public every Tuesday night. Yes. Um, and uh, a number of other STEM-related activities that were a part of that. Uh, so it's, it was really a school that uh, sort of closed that whole thing down, uh, and it was a big loss. But, uh, you know, we're lucky to have some of that STEM activity continuing on at New England SciTech in Natick. So uh, as many of you know, I'm Corey Mooney, currently the club president. I'm a mechanical engineer for a day job, and at home I just really like to tinker with stuff, especially telescopes. I haven't ground my own mirror yet, but I really like to mess around with the electromechanical side of astronomy, be it mounts or you know, focusers and stuff like that. Uh, so my talk today will just be a couple examples of some 3D printed projects that I had over this past year and just kind of trying to get people excited for the 3D printer we have at the club, which members will have access to. 
So uh, one of the first things I set out to do this year was almost a New Year's resolution from last year is to upgrade my battery box. So I do a lot of astrophotography and I run uh, cameras and heaters and mounts off my battery and originally my battery was just a lead acid stuffed in a box with wires poking out unfused, extremely dangerous. You crimp the wires, you get a dead short, you have a bad time. So this is something I've been meaning to improve for a long time and I finally set out to do it. And uh, I did it with uh, sort of half and half. So, you know, 3D printing isn't a cure-all. It's really good at some things, not so great at others. So in this case, I bought a, uh, a plastic ammo box, which provides a very sturdy, robust structure that's large and sealed and all that. And for the inputs and outputs, all the feed-throughs and all that stuff, I used the 3D printer for that, and I just bolted on. So that's kind of the best of both worlds. You get a cheap box for $12 that takes no time to build, and then the 3D printer builds the intricate part. So for this, I, I uh, implemented some <coughs> regulators and switches for the regulators and a voltmeter on top, which has been really nice. So the great thing with the 3D printer is the geometry is free, so you can kind of go hog wild. So I've used uh, Anderson power poles. If you see the profile of them, they kind of have these little dimples in the side. They're used for other purposes, but what I did is I, I basically had a cavity that they sat in that had those dimples and that uh, constrained them front to back so they can't get pulled out and then just had a toggle bar clamp them from the top. So the geometry kind of constrains it without having to have a bunch of glue on there. So it makes it easy to service and things like that. Another interesting use of the 3D printer is uh, tooling. So if we look at the top of this box, it has these little tiny corners and I want my thing to fit right there, just about the right spot. And it has these screw holes. So what I did is I just printed a template. It could have been a paper template, but I had the printer there anyway. So this template has the same, you know, this is a flat example, but it doesn't necessarily have to be flat. It could be the outer radius of an OTA and you get a three-dimensional template or jig to get a drill position accurate, very handy. So in this case, I just slid this piece where I want the box mark the holes, drill through, mark the cutouts for all the cables, and that worked out very well. So the box has worked out very well for me, and it was sort of the best of both worlds. Nice big chunky box with just little <coughs> detail prints. And uh, an another project that followed shortly after is, a few years ago I did an on-step conversion where you can take uh, an old manual mount and sort of give it new life with stepper motors and computer control. And I recently got a, a newer mount, similar sort of category and class and payload, but just a newer one that has ball bearings throughout. So I wanted to modernize that one and give it an uh, on-step conversion with stepper motors. So this past year I sort of redid an old project and remade the motor mounts, redesigned them, tweaked them to fit on this new mount. And another nice thing with 3D printing is, you know, you can, you can design one part, like this uh, right ascension motor mount on this side, and then in the computer, it's pretty easy to modify a couple pieces of geometry and use it for the, the oh, sorry, declination right ascension, got them switch back. And same thing for the cables, very slightly different size, but it's basically the same file. You just tweak one little thing. So you can kind of reuse stuff, which is handy. And uh, you can also do, you know, like I said earlier, geometry is free, so you can start to do weird stuff. Uh, for example, on the inside, there's a little Wi-Fi Bluetooth board. It's like a, a hobby-grade chip or a breakout board. Unfortunately, it has no board mounting holes. It's just, you know, the edge and the pins. There's nothing to grab onto. So with a 3D printer, you could make a you know, very specific geometry that the board can slip in like a rail and then just one screw to hold it down in its well. So you can do a lot of weird, silly stuff with a 3D printer. I mean, double-sided tape work would work just as well, but <laughs> half the printer will use it. And another thing is the cooling. You can, uh, you can again, you can do more bespoke stuff. So in this example, the fan is actually exhausting, and there are stepper drivers down here, which are pretty hot components. They have heat sinks. So by choosing to exhaust the ventilation, wherever I open a hole in the enclosure, I'll have a fresh draft of cool air to jet down and impinge on the components. So I can selectively position these jets to just blast the hottest parts in there. So it, the, the 
parts that demand the most cooling have very targeted cooling landing right on them, which is nice. And the similar thing uh, with the geometry, these boards are off the shelf. The ones that do have mounting holes is fairly easy in the CAD software. You just you know, re recreate the board hole positions and make little screw holes for them, and you can get real parts to bolt into 3D printed parts. Same for the uh, the panels. Instead of you know having to drill these out or carefully jigsaw them out for weird shaped stuff, you can just have it all printed, ready to go. You can have markings on there. So I've got right ascension, declination, focuser, and a hand pad marked into the plastic on the outside, which is nice. And there's an example of it together. So that's just no wires in CAD, but that's the other thing. You got to be careful in CAD because everything looks spacious when really it's not. So <laughs> give yourself a lot of room. In this case, I learned from my previous attempts, so I gave myself lots of margin this time around to stuff cables and connectors, and it came together a lot better this time. Uh, another similar project uh, was a dew heater and power distribution box for my telescope. And this actually recycled the same idea that I used on the battery box. You know, nice thing with CAD is once you figure out how to do something, you can just do it again and kind of cut and paste and drag it over. So the same exact approach, same exact geometry, just applied to a different part, saving a bunch of time where the Anderson power poles just slip in and they're retained by these little rails. And in this case, the actual cover provides the <coughs> toggle bar clamp that holds it all together. So this uh, is a dew heater it was achieved by these very inexpensive pulse width modulation modules you can get on eBay for like $3 a piece. They'll be two amps from zero to 100%, which is good enough for the tiny dew heaters that I need. So this has been a, some, another long product, you know, on the stack of projects that I need to get done. Previously, my dew heater was like a, a box of jello with one of these modules just taped to the side of it for insulation. And it worked, and I didn't change it for years. So this is a big upgrade from that. <laughs> and then uh, other stuff on the telescopes. So I've been having some issues with the star shapes. So using the 3D printer, I'd made a, a mirror edge mask that also incorporates the clips to retain the mirror, greatly reducing the obstruction. And uh, you can get really fine control in the geometries. So for example, the original clips, are, it's like a big rubber diving board. And it actually, you know, depending how floppy it is, it can touch the surface and you can get grit in any vibration when you're driving down the road, you get these buffing marks under the rubber. So for these, the clips, they're actually sort of canted at a slight angle, so only the edge really contacts. And because the printer is fairly accurate, you can accurately measure in there and make a, a rigid stack to ensure that you have a good space, but nothing is floppy. So my mirror is like completely free to I can lift it out of the cell like you know 0.4 millimeter, a half an inch or half a millimeter, and kind of clonk around. So there's no no clamping stress, no surface buffing or scuffing when it's in use, which is nice. And uh, another, another handy thing are tube rings for cameras. So you can clamp the camera body, but you can keep the, the uh, heat sink for the cooling free, stuff like that. You got different diameter bodies, you can design the rings differently. For the high stress threads, you can incorporate little brass threaded inserts, especially if you're going to be taking things in and out constantly. So that, that can make the parts more usable and robust. Uh, a very simple, simple project here is uh, like a, I use it as a, a spacer for my camera stack, but you could use it as a part focalizing ring where you can just print different heights and thicknesses once you figure out the offsets that you need. And then you can just slip them over your eyepieces and they can, you know, design them to be a little smaller so they spring clip on there, just friction alone, no set screws digging into your brand new naglers. So you, once they're on there, they just stay on there by friction. And, you can tune the height and print them as you need. And uh, all of this is to kind of inspire interest in the printer that we have at the club. I know uh, the uh, stats of it, it's about eight inches square by about 10 inches. The material we're printing mostly with is PETG, which is a good middle ground. It's fairly easy to print with, but it's pretty robust and can take some temperatures. For example, if you go camping and leave something in your car, 
you know, your finder scope isn't going to droop off your telescope. It's <laughs> a real number. Ask me how I know. Uh, we have a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is kind of middle of the road, reasonable detail. If we end up printing big chunky parts, we can maybe swap it for a big chunky nozzle and start to print large parts faster. And we'll be, be probably be printing from SD cards. And uh, a couple months ago or so, I did an intro to sort of overview of background of 3D printing. I've yet to do the actual tutorial on how to run the machine, so that's coming up soon. That may maybe piggyback onto work parties, so we're there, maybe the later <coughs> half of the work party, or it might be a dedicated day. So I have yet to put that lesson plan together, but it's coming up, so if you're interested, keep an eye out. Any questions? I'll take maybe two questions, and then we can continue. I brought the examples of parts over there. So after the meeting, if you want to poke and prod, we can look at it. Any questions? Question back there? So how much stuff is out there in the bigger community, you know, incorporating 3D printing and open source hardware and software and all that for building these sorts of things? Um, it's pretty good. There's some really great projects. Um, there's like Ardu Focus. You can build your own ro motorized robotic focuser that has uh, ASCON drivers. You can print the parts, motor bracketry and stuff like that. It uses an Arduino. You borrow their open source software, flash it, tune it to your settings. I think it piggy piggybacks off a of Moonlight focuser driver. It uses the same protocol, so it appears to be the same thing. So you can kind of plug and play, piece it together, and motorize anything. Similar things for OnStep is all open source software. Uh, great open source um, bath interferometer designs. A lot of that heavily relies on 3D printing. Uh, there's been some pretty cool projects of like entire 3D printed camera trackers and other stuff. And anything you make, if you choose, you can freely share onto an online repository for people to search. I think Alva had I just wanted to add, um, if you just go to Thingiverse.com and search for telescope or anything astronomy related, you'll find all kinds of specialized things. Yeah. And I, there's a, it's always worth checking. There's a, um, there's a, a, a Newtonian reflector, you know, strut based, you know, like six inch telescope made out of like 95% of its 3D printed parts. Okay. It's a really cool stuff up there. Yeah. If, you, if you're trying to solve a problem, it's always worth checking if someone's already solved it on Thingiverse and you yeah. just download it and print it and save the design time. Albert? How do you see the brass inserts? So I use a soldering iron. So I, I have, a, I have a, mm, yeah. a junk tip that I don't care about if it gets charred plastic on it. And my soldering iron is adjustable. I can turn it up or down. But I used to do it with 30 watt Radio Shack ones that mm. it takes a, maybe a couple attempts, so get some scrap parts, practice on it, but it's pretty reliable to set them in. Mm -hmm. And usually when I design it, I design a deep chamfer around there because it tends to lift a lip of plastic. So if you want two parts to mate together, you either have to shave that plastic off or give it a reservoir where it can accumulate. Mm -hmm. And I usually sink the inserts slightly down below grade. So, handy tips. If you have a nice soldering iron, they actually make specific tips for doing it. Mm. Yeah. So I have luck with M3 up to M6, but if you went really small, you'd probably have trouble, or really big, it'd be too big for the tip. But mm -hmm. for usual, usually use small astronomy stuff is kind of M3, M5, M6. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the 3D printer. Is there a um, a computer with a slicer program at the clubhouse, or do you have to run your own stuff? Uh, not currently, but I plan to set it up on the clubhouse computer there. We'll probably be using Cura. I'll probably set up some sort of black box slicer setting bundle, so you don't have to tune stuff for yourself. You can sort of, you know, with supports, without supports, that sort of thing. And if you know what, if you know how to use it, you can dive in and start modifying stuff. It will teach people troubleshooting and how to modify stuff like that too. So, uh, any last question from Zoom or anything? Christine has her hand up. Christine? Yeah, hi, Corey. Thanks. Um, good talk, by the way. I just want to comment for those people who are, um, and Corey, you may have mentioned this too, but for those people who are designing, a lot of manufacturers now provide um, 3D um, 
models of their of their parts. I mean, from screws to inserts to boards to everything. And what you do is you just go download them and include them in your project and, and you can space around them or you can match drill holes or you can even like, I mean, I don't do threads. I usually tap my holes. Um, you know, I've been doing this long enough. I know, you know, threaded inserts don't, you know, are, are just as effective, um, but the plastic holds fairly well with a good plastic screw. But um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can download all kinds of stuff. McMaster's entire catalog uh, has 3D printable um, downloads. So if you want some tiny little obscure part, you can just download it and include it in your model. So either as a negative space or as part of your model itself. So that's, that's very similar to how I designed the enclosure box for OnStep. The, the 3D printing motherboard manufacturer had a 3D model for it. The little Wi-Fi board had a 3D model. So I make an empty assembly with all these pieces and parts and space and then just start playing around, trying to package them together. And oh, maybe if I order it, orient it this way or maybe I sandwich it this way. And it's just kind of like playing around with it on your desk and trying to figure out how the pieces should fit together and where you want stuff. And once you figure out where all the stuff is, then you can start modeling the part that holds it all together, which is a great approach. So with that, I'll end the presentation and I'll, I'll definitely hang around and if you have questions over there, I can talk. Um, so with that, I'll officially close. The meeting. Thank you. Welcome. So with this uh, official close of the meeting, next meeting will be February 9th. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gordon. Have a nice day.